So, uh, so good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Great to see uh, you again in our public lectures. I noticed that some of the guests are coming uh, again and again. It means that the content is great. Uh, my name is Agnes Stanta. I'm heading uh, marketing and communication uh, department in Riga Business School. And it's my pleasure to renew the tradition of public uh, lectures, which the school had some time ago. Then COVID did, uh, made that. Uh, other priorities, put the other priorities on the list, and now we are back. Um, it was also great to see some of you in our company visits. So um, you are enjoying the, the networking provided by Riga Business School. And I noticed from the list uh, that half of the guests are actually alumni of uh, Riga Business School. So, so welcome back. And some of you enjoyed the seat in alumni uh, audience, which is also great. So what we have managed to do this uh, yeah, I don't know the big as as I am not the main person today, it might be also not recorded, but uh, so let's have it. Um because the guests are the, the, the key speakers today. Uh so let me just remind that uh what we did uh, this season, uh, first of all, we had the one session dedicated to network analysis. Well, the Krebs was uh, here. Uh, it was quite a well-attended lecture. People asked a lot of questions. Then uh, a few weeks ago, we, we actually had another HR-related topic, but it was uh, uh, mainly uh, dedicated to remote working uh, and, and hybrid working. Uh, it was arranged by our alumni association, so it was also great to see many people here. And now we are somewhat repeating the topic, again, HR area, but um, I'm happy to, to share that this time it's more on HR and data, which is a fantastic combination these days. And uh, it's my pleasure, actually, to, to mention that uh, Christiana Boscia is currently a student of Riga Business School, so it's great to invite people who are currently studying. So you, 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 you noticed someone you recognize in the room, yeah? Might be. <laughs> <laughs> Might be. Uh, and uh, also uh, uh, Iria Rae, and I will try to introduce also based on the current uh, uh, positions and current roles. Uh, and I will let also Iria to introduce herself as well, because uh, mainly uh, we know Fontes uh, as a company in Latvia working with recruitment, with executive uh, leadership uh, recruitment. But uh, currently there are a few changes in uh, Fontes uh, operations, and I will not uh, uh, go into details because Iria can do it better than than, than I do, but uh, Iria and Christian represents uh, uh, quite a new company called uh, uh, Figure Baltic Advisory. So Iria will share the insights, what the company is, uh, what it stands for. And we will have another speaker, Janis Kaltis, joining via, via uh, Zoom. So three of the representatives are actually here. And uh, with uh, big applauses, I want to introduce uh, Iria. So Iria, stage is yours, mic is yours. Also, and, uh, please take, uh, I will put the presentation. Good evening and, and uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me and, and for being here. So, so it... yes, yeah. and... Um, right. So, um, yes, Fontes. What's the story about Fontes? I have to go back some 30 years. So Fontes was actually the first uh, um, uh, publicly owned, privately owned company which was established in Estonia. So it was at the end of uh, um, uh, 1989, so before even we regained our uh, independence. 
And uh, we were concentrating basically on publishing uh, psychological books and, uh, and also developing uh, psychometric testing. So in uh, 1995, um, after executive search had been already in process for three, four years, um, uh, they started to realize, I was not with the company at that time yet, they started to realize that actually HR also requires some data and the HR requires uh, compensation data. So since 1995, we have been uh, active in having uh, compensation service, first in Estonia, then in Latvia, and since 2007 also in Lithuania. And uh, as ownership changed, uh, then uh, Fontes was actually um, owned by different, different partners in different countries. And in uh, 2022, uh, we joined our forces again, and now this compensation service will be provided by, by one company, which is Vigor Baltic Advisory. We shouldn't be using Fontes any longer because Fontes in Latvia is still concentrating on executive search. Uh, Fontes in Estonia has uh, full uh, talent life cycle and Lithuania, they don't use Fontes at all. So uh, since the 1st of September, we are uh, Figure Baltic Advisory and we are present in all three Baltic countries. And, and uh, the well, most well-known uh, product or solution of ours is uh, a Figure Baltic Salary Survey. And uh, actually, um, we are quite proud to say that we are biggest uh, data uh, market, data, salary market data provided in the Baltics. So in Estonia, we have had even a joke that Board of Statistics said that, oh, we have a new development now. Sorry, Fontes, we will be your competitor. So I took it as the biggest compliment. Um, and uh, this is our market coverage. So quite, uh, quite well represented in all three Baltic countries. Uh, I have to say that we uh, will not invite into our service uh, companies who have less than 20 employees. Uh, it, it, it's oriented for, for bigger companies. And if we take the, uh, the number of bigger companies in Estonia and in Latvia, then we actually cover almost... Uh, 25% oh, of those. And in Lithuania, we still have uh, some development, oh, sorry, room, but, uh, but, but yes, we have done well, Christiana. We should be proud at ourselves. And, uh, and yes, uh, we have had also active otherwise, because we stand for more transparent and equal uh, world uh, of work for everybody and already for quite a few years we have been awarding also companies with equal pay awards and our methodology changes compared to the, um, the international ones which uh, which uh, say that uh, there is a huge uh, uh, pay gap between men and women salaries uh, in the Baltics. Uh, we don't see such a big gap because we compare similar jobs, but we don't compare only salaries. We also see that uh, uh, men and women have uh, the equal opportunities in terms of jobs so that we will not have uh, financial analytics only uh, men and uh, accountants only uh, ladies, but actually uh, the, the composition of, of uh, of workforce is more diverse. So um, how to make uh, uh, the, the world of work more equal and transparent? This has been our mission for, 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 from the very beginning. And, and really, let's, let's figure out uh, what really matters. And I start with a very colorful picture, but it's the most colorful picture I have. After that, I have only graphs, but I thought, that maybe it's good to start um, with uh, some keywords uh, from our cooperation partner Mercer, uh, who has uh, who has published uh, 
also different surveys, including uh, talent trends. It's a global survey, and each year they try to um, map what has been uh, changing uh, in the market, uh, and uh, they interview uh, CEOs, uh, HR directors, and also people. And and uh, based on 2022, uh, five um, more or less prominent trends uh, kind of uh, came out. And I dare to say that uh, many of that we already see also um, uh, in the Baltics. So uh, we have lots of international companies. So, um, so yes, I have to move closer because otherwise I don't see what is on the slides. But, but yes, if we talk about uh, uh, relevance, uh, it's all about diversity. It's, it's all about uh, having equal opportunities for, for, uh, um, for both uh, sexes, for different orientations, different ages. Uh, so um, this diversity uh, is not simple, as we all know, but at the same time, it characterizes uh, like uh, this uh, present uh, uh, world of work we, we all are active in. Then uh, we don't speak about bosses and uh, sub subordinates any longer. We work in partnership and, and uh, we all know that, uh, especially in the Baltics, when the labor market is so tight, we don't know who chooses who, employer, employee, or is it vice versa? Or do you have different? Uh, experience. Yes, actually, um, we don't have, uh, 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 from one perspective, we don't have enough people, but uh, but also, yes, our, our uh, company's um, uh, labor structure is getting more and more kind of uh, complex. And, and people lack proper skills and, and we know how, how difficult it is to recruit just anybody, let alone IT uh, people. So it means uh, that uh, uh, actually uh, we, we work as partners and, and uh, what people cherish is transparency, is understandable way how you handle different types of rewards. Uh, in your organization, how well you are with your arguments, uh, uh, what happens, when happen, uh, uh, and why uh, things happen. Then uh, a buzzword, I would say, and, and uh, more and more popular, and Christian also will be talking about it, uh, is uh, well-being. Uh, since COVID, it's, it's, it has been, also before COVID time, it has been a very, very popular topic. And worldwide, uh, Mercer has reported that uh, the budget for all different uh, well-being solutions is increasing and, and increasing uh, much faster compared to uh, salary, uh, salary uh, funds. So it means it really actually is important to, uh, to offer work conditions, uh, well-being solutions, recovery solutions to, to all employees. Uh, then um, one um, important thing is uh, skills. I would say that skills uh, are new oil. I mean, if you have proper skill set, then future is bright. Do you agree? <laughs> because uh, yes, how can you <laughs> otherwise? Yes, proper skill set, and and uh, we all know that. Uh, of course, different IT related skills are in great demand. Also, different uh, people who can make a different and very sophisticated uh, models and calculations. Uh, uh, also, manage complex projects. Uh, have uh, good uh, people skills to be uh, team leads and, and, and managers and executives, uh, have a very good uh, collaboration skills in different environment where everything is diverse, everything is hybrid and, and your team is, is all over the world. So um, proper skill sets uh, is, is a very important asset and, uh, and uh, talent actually 
expect companies to invest into into their skill set so that uh, they are also employable tomorrow, not only today. And uh, as we all know that uh, that salary increase has been uh, very fast and and actually it's not only in the Baltics but but also in other countries, then one uh, kind of advice which Mercer has uh, uh, put together consists of the following that maybe we should uh, be more fast with uh, salary reviews and each time a person, uh, kind of acquires um, necessary skill for the company, then maybe the reward uh, change has to be implemented. So instead of once per year, maybe two, three times a year, so that uh, if, 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 if a skill is, is uh, implemented uh, uh, as, as was expected. So um, this was one kind of... Uh, idea which came out of the survey and another topic was related to location you all know that uh, i i think it's also in latvia at least it is in estonia that Tallinn and uh, the capital area has highest salary level um, and uh, it was all fine uh, before covid but how, how do you pay if a person for example lives in Tallinn? and works for Tartu or lives in Tallinn and uh, or lives in Tartu and works for Tartu, works for Tallinn so it's uh, it's so confused now and one uh, kind of uh, uh, one kind of uh, suggestion that came out of this survey was uh, was location blindness maybe companies should review their regional policies and and actually uh, get rid of this location uh, location uh, uh, related uh, pace. Uh, it has happened already in ICT sector. I would say uh, also in Latvia you may live whenever, but if you work for ICT sector, you don't get paid for for that area where where you actually live. It's more uh, evident at the moment with uh, customer service uh, uh, sector, so that uh, customer service uh, uh, person in Latvia gets higher salary compared to customer in Riga gets higher salary compared to customer service representative living and working in Liepaja. I mixed up Liepa and Klaipeda, so that's why I was trying to be correct geographically. So yes, it, it's quite common. And also it's in Lithuania, it's in Latvia, it's it's in Estonia. But uh, the world is is moving towards, uh, towards uh, less uh, having those regional differences with those jobs, which can be done from anywhere. So it, you shouldn't be paid based on, on the location of your office. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's also uh, with it's also a problem with US, right? That uh, there used to be definitely more uh, regions in US. Uh, at the moment, uh, they have a national uh, average, which is implemented uh, for for many states. But uh, yes, New York, uh, San Francisco uh, still are paying higher salaries, provided people live and work there. But if they live in Hawaii and play golf, so it, it's uh, a little bit more complicated. And um, but we have also heard that companies, US companies, for example, have uh, uh, developers working in Poland. And they also have been quite uh, kind of uh, um, not so happy about uh, the about the um, solution that uh, why we in Poland, when we do exactly the same work and we do, ex we, we do with the same complexity, the same skill set, why do we 
uh, get uh, less paid compared to, okay, let's New York be New York, but uh, this US national average. And uh, there has been structure, salary structures with a couple of companies I know that they have done uh, so that they have taken an index, let's say San Francisco is 1.1 and all regions have been adjusted by the cost of living index. There are possibilities already available, quite exact, uh, exact uh, kinds of indexes you can implement. Of course, you need ranges and, 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 and like that, but uh, to have this cost of living aspect uh, into your salary structure, because salaries used to be very much local phenomena. Okay, uh, and then of course, uh, the purpose is, it has been uh, also in the narrative for quite a long, that people don't uh, sing for money, at least they don't sing uh, very long and, and with great enthusiasm, people need purpose and how to make your work, a daily work meaningful. So um, this is uh, the last blue one. So these are like the general trends uh, related uh, to uh, global outlook. And I would say that uh, the same uh, local kind of thing, ver uh, local versus uh, one salary versus uh, regional salaries. It's a hot topic in Estonia as well. And I, I guess also in, in Latvia and especially with those companies uh, who have uh, for example, branches all over the country and who, who uh, used to have different uh, kinds of approaches to reward the same, uh, typically front office roles. And, and also this purpose, if you look just any uh, employer branding uh, kind of uh, message, then it all starts with why, why we exist and, and why uh, you work here and, and why uh, and how your work has impact. And it's very, very important, especially for for younger generations. For, for us as well, maybe we are a little bit more skeptical about it, but, uh, but the younger ones really cherish this uh, bigger than me purpose. And, and also this uh, as uh, like more uh, more um, uh, often than once per year salary review. It has been done this year because of inflation, but, uh, but how to uh, relate it to something like more substantial than inflation. Yes, companies are, IT companies are reviewing more often than once per year. And the skill set is, is definitely one reason to change a salary. All right. And yeah. Excuse me for. Mm -hmm. It will be here in the presentation. Yes. Mm -hmm. oh. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, twenty twenty two and and Baltic uh, compensation uh, changes. So uh, this is our sample uh, in all three Baltic countries and, and uh, we are proud at it quite a bit. But of course, especially in Lithuania, also in Latvia, in Estonia, we have room to even be bigger, but all in, in good times. So, and um, if we look at uh, the compensation change, when Figure Baltic speaks about uh, compensation uh, change, then it's done differently compared to Board of Statistics because we have uh, data from different companies uh, and each year. So we actually uh, compare those, um, we, we calculate them based on the same employees doing the same job. In uh, practically, we are talking about salary inflation. So for the same job, uh, how much uh, the price has changed. And of course, if we take those, uh, those numbers, uh, then I would say uh, this year, uh, um, the salary increase was uh, double digit. 
change was also close to um to double digit, but people salaries uh, purchase power diminished. It's um it's a sad thing actually, but uh, but yes, if we uh if we look at uh, the numbers in terms of uh, monthly base salary change for the same job, then yes, inflation was bigger. Inflation changes all the time. These numbers have been taken as uh, the 1st of October. So probably now they are already a little bit different, bigger or bigger or, or smaller, I would say who cares, but they are huge compared to the numbers which we are used to. So um, if we look at the monthly base salary uh, uh, change uh, or salary inflation, then uh, it actually is far from uh, from the inflation. So which, which, which means actually salaries purchase power is decreasing. You are fam familiar with the term purchase power. I have not uh, I have not seen actually in in uh, any of of uh, our customers uh, salary uh, salary policy a clause that uh, we guarantee that our employees uh, uh, salaries purchase power does not decrease but it's quite common in some states in in US so uh, it 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 would be very very difficult in in this year to keep up with this inflation, and uh, and we um, uh, gather data uh, like uh, on all instruments uh, from total reward package, and from monetary reward we are talking about base salary. It can can be like uh, paid out in different forms like. Uh, like a piece rate, uh, whatever, and it is actually uh, gathered um, uh, from uh, normal working time. So we don't include, uh, uh, what's the word? No, oh, yes, thank you, uh, overtime uh, pay. So for normal working hours. So, um, and annual total cash, it includes uh, different types of variable pay. So, uh, um, and it has not been like that. If we, if we look at uh, 2021, then the same numbers are considerably smaller. You see the change uh, calculated based on the same uh, employees was much, uh, much smaller in, in base salary and also in, in annual total cash. And if we take even one year before 2020, then again, there are differences, but nothing uh, like double digit numbers. So, um, and if we compare, for example, Mercer survey in, in Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, then we see that the numbers are, change numbers are even smaller, like three, two percent typically. And, and this is salary inflation because uh, salary can change and, and will change also if you, for example, get promotion or or if you rotate into another role, which, which has as bigger complexity and bigger um, uh, responsibility for the same job with a with a with a few uh, maybe changed tasks. So quite uh, quite a difficult uh, situation for for any uh, company. So um, and yes, uh, there has been differences uh, um, in terms of markets. Lithuania was uh, quite low in, in annual total cash in 2020 and, and uh, Latvia in base salary and, and Estonia in 2021. If we looked at uh, this COVID and, and um, COVID two years, then uh, we also in Estonia were quite afraid what will happen, but we had a very strong uh, support measures by unemployment fund that all companies who could report that uh, their business dropped, uh, say, uh, 30%, then they compensated uh, for three months people's salaries. And, uh, and it happened uh, typically uh, April, March, uh, um, uh, April, May and June. And it meant that uh, actually companies were increasing salaries 
and then they got uh, unemployment unemployment fund uh, or state subsidy and they could uh, live uh, after covid quite quite well but the same measure was not active in 2021 that's why estonian uh, dynamics in 2021 was was slower um and and if we look at uh, the extent so how many people got uh, increases uh, for the same job we also see that uh, from from the distant countries are similar but uh, but the most active or most uh, kind of uh, um, sorry um, aggressive change uh, took place in Lithuania. So Lithuania was reviewing salaries for the same jobs uh, um, with with the greatest extent. In Estonia, it was so so, and Latvia a little bit uh, uh, even more slower. And and. Uh, Yes, it's very difficult to uh, decrease uh, base salary. That's why with base salary column, we see there are no changes. But but very active actually uh, increase because on top of that, uh, I just remind you, we also have to change salaries for those who get promoted, who change jobs. We have to find money for newcomers. Uh, and and what what has happened in 2022, and in a way it's also good because um, somehow companies understood that uh, the most valuable asset, their people, are already working with them, and they have to review their salaries first because recruitment costs are much higher. It it has not been like that. And I think you also have seen that, uh, for example, somebody joins a company, a newcomer, and, and gets a higher salary compared to the person who actually trains, uh, trains uh, that uh, newcomer. It was not uh, a case in 2022, uh, in general. I wouldn't say that uh, nobody did like that, but in general, it was not the case. Uh, com company valued companies valued uh, people who already worked with them and and try to uh, review salaries first. And uh, if we look at the salary levels, um, then uh, first of all, I have to explain what those numbers uh, uh, below here see. We each job is uh, um, has a size. And, and we um, measure the size by, by different factors, uh, by um, experience and, and education, what is required to do the job properly, then also what kinds of con complexity the job has, and also what kinds of responsibility the job holder has. So altogether, this exercise ends up with point value which you see here below. And based on that point value, we can, so this is, ah, oh, this is also working. But I have only one screen, which means, oh, somewhere you see here below, a point values, it didn't work well. I'm not trying anymore. So uh, this is working, but I just couldn't put my laser on the right place. So Christiana, you have to practice before. <laughs> You start. So uh, point value is here below, and and uh, um, it that is not a job with zero value. It's not possible. But if we start with with uh, around hundred up to two hundred, then we typically uh, speak about uh, blue collar roles. But also those very simple secretarial duties, which you take in without a special kind of uh, education required. Starting from two hundred, we will have either expert qualified workers or already uh, junior and and experienced professionals. Starting from 300, we have experts and also some first level managers. Uh, then um, up to uh, they go up to uh, 450, and from 500, we have uh, uh, executive levels. So if you see the three countries um, and and how 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 different countries uh, 
rewards uh, different segments of employees, then we can see that uh, uh, Estonia um, uh, actually uh, pays quite well also uh, for its uh, qualified and workers and qualified workers. But uh, if we talk about uh, top professionals uh, between uh, 350 and uh, 450 points, then Lithuania catches us up. And, and uh, so in some places, Lithuania uh, goes over Estonian level. And Latvia, um, with, with, uh, with its salary level, is, is uh, below these two countries. We have seen that uh, uh, Lithuanian salary level has increased quite a lot. But again, if you look at the lines, so don't be too enthusiastic about Lithuania yet. The tax system is also different. Uh, so if we uh, if we um, take uh, net salaries, then the picture is uh, is different. But if we take uh, employers' costs, employer employee employers' costs, then actually Lithuania is is quite good place to find people, and and also. Um, in that perspective, Lithuanian labor market is the biggest in, in all three Baltic countries. So yes, uh, salary levels are different. Um, uh, and and if, we, if we have net salaries, then the picture uh, changes. So, and, um, and speaking about uh, salary reviews, then basically, um, uh, most companies uh, try to review salaries uh, over the four first quarter of each year. But uh, year after year, the number of companies also increases who hasn't set an exact time for review. And uh, one uh, thing which also came in 2022, um, uh, and it was about how to reward how to compensate uh, this uh, heavy level of inflation in all three Baltic countries. Some companies have also made uh, uh, so that instead of reviewing everything in the first quarter in 2023, they implement some of the changes already now. But we will have a better look. Uh, so, uh, but in, in, in general, yes, the first quarter is still the time when when salaries change and and von, figure baltic takes uh, salary data in as the first of may or june and the reports are ready in 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 august the latest and then companies can use the uh, the information to make uh, their budgets and and uh, start uh, discuss uh, individual salary changes so any questions are you sleepy already? Evening is quite late. All fine? Okay, great. So, um, and uh, of course, it's always very interesting to see what a person has to do in order to get a change. And um, it's also very good if a company has a salary policy which sets uh, the principles uh, how, when and, and on on what conditions uh, uh, company reviews salaries. Because I think you don't believe me uh, when I tell you that uh, there are lots of companies in Estonia whose managers have told me that, no, I will not change anything. No, when he has his uh, notice that he's planning to leave, no, of course I review then. Why bother before? So it's a very short-sighted policy. I, I do th know that in Latvia, everything is totally different. And, and yes, but, but anyway, it, it would be great if, uh, if the policy is uh, put down in writing that uh, what a person has to do in order to have uh, expectations to be reviewed in terms of the same job, not in promotion conditions. And, and um, yes, uh, the, the, the reasons are different. So uh, in Estonia and Latvia, it's very important how, how the person is contributing. So what, uh, what, what is the performance? 
but uh, in Lithuania, the most important factor altogether is organizational performance. Uh, one thing which uh, has been also discussed is the length of service. Um, it is like good and bad. If, if we take some rules, for example, if we take legal or also if we take consulting business or, or, or just any professional services, I too believe this 10,000 uh, hours uh, a person has to perform bef before we can sp speak about expert level role. Just uh, 10,000 hours makes five years. So um, just some time. But of course, uh, there are lots of uh, jobs in the market, which actually um, is not, that does not require such a long dedication. Those new roles like digital marketing, uh, you know, all those Google Analytics, uh, people come and, and start uh, contributing uh, maybe like uh, in a year because they know all the technical skills. They just need to find out what has to be analyzed and they need to know the business. So, yes, but uh, the, the, the length of service in some roles, it has to be also cherished. Uh, because in a way, I, I felt, uh, maybe I'm so old already myself that uh, I have seen different times and, and uh, that in, in 90s and in, two, in around 2000, it was so that, uh, oh, you have worked for that company for three years too, too stagnant. You have to be like more vibrant and change more and, and have more experience. This uh, length of service is not necessarily bad. And if we look, for example, at uh, um, engineer roles in Germany, then the salary, uh, salary line uh, grows each year based on tenure up to 10 years. And then this length of service is, has no impact anymore. But up to the 10th year, Length of uh, service is important because you grow with 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 your work. You uh, solve more complex problems and you implement more uh, difficult uh, or complex uh, uh, technical expertise. So, and uh, and uh, and if we talked about uh, levels and changes and reasons then there are also different components in, in each country. But all in all, the picture is quite the same. Uh, we have different components. And, um, and uh, for example, those uh, first three, we classify as base salary. They just can be paid out in different forms. But uh, um, short-term incentives, these are those intense, intensive incentives which are paid out uh, within one year and and long-term incentives then this um, period is over one year so we are talking about stock options uh, uh, shares uh, what whatever the instrument is used and uh, the the number of uh, long-term incentives in Estonia is quite uh, few I mean the proportion of companies who offer, but if we look at, for example, ICT sector, then the number of companies who offer these long-term incentives is increasing each year. Because in a way, it's, it's a good option how to, um, how to connect person's uh, contribution with companies' uh, kind of well-being and financial results. Uh, so, and... Um, and forecast, yeah. Yes, it means uh, uh, out of out of uh, uh, the sample, how many companies uh, have it, and and how many don't. So out of the sample, the proportion. Almost half the companies 
But it's also overly based, but not on time-based calculation, but uh, based on hours, because we proportion our the biggest uh, part of our sample is production. And for example, in, in production, lots of workers have uh, hourly pays. And, and, uh, and yeah, that's it. Who work in shifts, for example, yeah. Yeah. I think we share those slides later. So then, yeah, and uh, forecast, uh, these are, uh, we, we don't make uh, economic models, and, and these are the forecasts what our uh, uh, participants uh, provide us with. So how much they are planning to change, and uh, this forecast was made uh, 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 at the beginning of uh, June or, or May or July, so uh, at the beginning of summer. So uh, these numbers uh, are quite uh, moderate, I would say. And if we look at the pulse survey, which, which uh, we made in October, then already the numbers have, uh, have increased. Because uh, yes, in October, we, we tried to find out uh, what companies now have planning, are, are planning to do to cope with this uh, heavy impact of, of inflation. And um, and we didn't have so many companies as in our regular survey. Uh, it was approximately 156 companies who were participating. But you see that uh, it was uh, done in October, then 30% of the sample, like uh, 50 companies. It's not huge, but one third of these 156 companies uh, already had done something after after the uh, after the submission of data to us so uh, and it means that uh, uh, they uh, they had uh, average unplanned uh, salary review by 12 percent and uh, they had increased like seven percent for every employees of course uh, not from everybody we couldn't ask but uh, with those whom we talked to Many companies did it because the salary level compared to the market was uh, below median. So they, they just felt that they have to adjust some uh, some data. Yeah? Yeah, question is average on planned salary. Uh, this is the number percentage of the uh, company companies. But what was, what is the scale of people who were affected by the unplanned, unplanned uh, salary reviews? Mm -hmm. So you see that uh, 30, no, let's say the first, let's, let's take Lithuania, 25% out of 120 uh, companies uh, uh, made unplanned salary reviews. And uh, actually, uh, uh, average uh, salary increase in Lithuania for all employees was 6%. So it was this e indexed uh, approach what they, they implemented. And uh, and uh, this ten percent, it was not implemented to everybody. That's the question: how, how many people were affected by what I don't know people? what the, I I don't know because uh, it depends on the number of uh, employees uh, those twenty five percent of the sample had. It could be like uh, if if uh, for example if I have thousand employees, and uh, I work in Lithuania. And I answered that I made uh, average salary increase for all employees. Then it means uh, all uh, thousand employees received increase. But whether six percent or 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 more, this is average. It might also vary a bit. Hmm? Not answered question yeah. yet. Because it it the calculation is made. Uh, Just comment. I have one more, but uh, comment. Mm -hmm. uh, 
regarding uh, the employee groups, most of the question is uh, which is impacted by that state. Uh, so the company does not uh, change the salary most uh, frequently for all of the employees within the company. There are seldomly uh, groups of employees where this effect on the inflation is uh, also on the salaries. So if the company had thousands of uh, employees, most probably not all of them got how oh, many, I don't know, this question was not asked, but what we see that uh, yes. are seldom they selected the uh, specific even like groups, yeah. yeah. Which means actually 25% of companies, percentage of employees, even less. So you see not all the people in company, yeah. 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 And yeah, we, we all we make actually two types of analysis. One of them is uh, company, uh, uh, company based. So each company has one statistics into this comparison, so that each companies have the same weight. And another one is employee uh, weighted. It means uh, they provide us data. Uh, we calculate based on all employees. It's a similar approach as Board of Statistics uh, provides. So in that in that case, we asked from company with not like for every each employee. We didn't gather salary information. We just asked to fill in the number. Uh, but those cases, but these these are like the practice is very very uh, different. And it probably depends on the compensation level the company has at the moment. But uh, of course, when you make a, an irregular salary increase, then it's easy to give everybody 3% instead of start calculating and discussing, you will get 5%, you will get 2%, somebody get 10%. If you see that the company is below the market, then let's have them uh, all 3% or 4% or 7%. It doesn't mean that uh, that was not more differentiated approaches. More like uh, uh, the same approach for everybody was more related to these allowances that uh, they try, if, if company decided to pay allowance to compensate uh, electricity costs, then they typically offered one sum to everybody. They didn't uh, ask you to uh, kind of present your electricity bills or or they didn't uh, relate it to salary level. Then it was like one sum to everybody or some one employee group to everybody, for example, which is, uh, which is also um, has been discussed is uh, to support uh, more those employees whose salary level is uh, below national average salary. I mean, those whose salary level is lower. And, and uh, but uh, what is low salary in, in each individual company? For example, one company reported in the Estonian survey that we support everybody whose salary level is low. It means uh, 2,500 uh, 2, euros per month. So it's your decision. Is it the low salary or is it a kind of normal salary? So it was, it was I, I think the more, more important message here is uh, that uh, companies actually uh, try to support their employees. Uh, and, and one third of, of the sample did it. And, um, and just, yeah. Uh, it, it's uh, so and so. What I have heard is more that we support those employees who have lower salaries. And and uh, what is low salary is like a question of, of, of 
like a decision inside each company. And there has been also companies who pay out, for example, two monthly salaries, but uh, they typically don't have uh, too many employees. And is the salary le level low? Not necessarily. So yes, in a way, uh, we see salary changes, we're heating up also this inflation. But uh, try to explain it to the person who gets 500 euro electricity bill and, and the salary, proto salary, pro salary is uh, 1500. So, in a way, companies have tried to support. And, and this uh, has already happened. It means when we had uh, this questionnaire, it happened in October. And uh, and this is something which uh, companies uh, have planned to implement uh, uh, before the end of 22, yeah? No, the first one, they had already done the change and they are included uh, in, in this statistic also. But uh, these numbers are bigger because but next year, yes, I don't know, probably, yes, we'll see, yeah. But uh, this is something also what has been discussed, that, for example, if, if a company was planning to increase the salary by 8%, then 4% uh, might have paid out already in 2022. So uh, if we compare two years, then actually the percentage is it, it's, it's still 8%, but it was like paid out earlier, yeah? Oh, yeah, this data is based on the responses to your survey. Pulse survey, yes. Not for the whole, all companies in the whole country. No, no. Yes, and it's, uh, yes, it's a trend. No, 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 no. If it's, uh, no. In theory, it uh, is possible if we take the list of companies, if we see how many employees they have and how they have answered, it's possible. But it's actually not the purpose of the survey. It was more to reflect a fast change, what, what company has uh, done, because uh, we had lots of questions, right? You're right. Yeah. There are two ways how you collect the information, and Jan will probably will tell us a bit more. Uh, this is the pulse survey when you ask company, have you done anything? And they say, yes, no, that's the level. Uh, when we are gathering information on the salaries, which is done once per year, we are collecting information on each and every individual. Base salary, change on the base salary, uh, the bonus paid out, and so on. Uh, the, the paradox is that everybody wants to know what is the impact from the inflation currently, but to collect that data, Actually, not so many companies are giving uh, so detailed data just to calculate out that that thing what we are uh, interested in. Yeah, but so the poll survey gets quick uh, response from the market that we do not have the information on a very detailed level. And we will have a forecast survey also at the end of the year. So we will get also some questionnaire based. Uh, uh, thank you. Yes, we have. Uh, the, the salary survey approach, then we actually ask uh, companies to fill in uh, like the table per each person. We don't know who the persons are, but if you have, for example, thousand employees, then now a salary table will have thousand rows. So then, then we can calculate based on uh, employees and based on organizations. But this is just to show you the trend. And uh, the trend is uh, that companies care. And, and they try to figure out what to do uh, to help and support their employees. Uh, right, and uh, this I will leave out. So, um, I, and I will give a word to Christiana, who will talk about very, very important topic. I have a question. Yes. Yeah, that's the point of this presentation, just to make an overview on the uh, currently, in the company that I work, uh, they started to implement a pure research process mm -hmm. and uh, to evaluate the employment level of rewards and salaries mm -hmm. to see 
And basically on this uh, uh, search, they are coming with some kind of uh, um, reward policy towards the next period. So they do not provide any solution immediately, but they are looking for the next mm -hmm. period. And uh, they started with this uh, job value points, mm -hmm. uh, like un understanding uh, what is the levels of the current employees where in the production company. So basically we have lots of uh, employees that are in line and mm -hmm. some, uh, some kind of managers and NPC. So how to understand and how to relate correctly what is the value points of your current like uh, uh, position? Because like, uh, when I see uh, how do they understand the, the position and the duties, I would say that they somehow underestimate the values itself. Mm -hmm. Because basically on these values in future, they they will say that the level of my uh, salary is quite okay mm -hmm. because they compare with the media, mm -hmm. uh, maybe the data, mm -hmm. and they say, it's fine, we're overpaying you about 30%, so mm -hmm. you should feel for yourself. I have a short answer and a long answer. Okay. Short answer is invite Christiana to evaluate your jobs. <laughs> And long answer is, let's talk about it uh, after the presentation, because I will... Uh... No, I, I don't know, because the contest, they, they are, like, some of your company employees, definitely, they are uh, invited to evaluate and to see, yes, understand. But uh, basically, when I see the result of the job, they say that I'm fine with the salary, so it's, it's on, I'm overpaid, right? And then... <laughs> And I'm really, uh, when I see like this data, I should say that, of course, my team, okay, for example, they are overpaid 30%. So I say, okay, uh, then I don't have, I don't need two employees, then let's be three employees in place. So I will have made much more working hours for the team and uh, the performance will be better. But actually, I don't see that, uh, that actually it would be possible to employee on that basically salary that they are throwing to you. It's a long answer. Let's have it after the lecture. <laughs> because there are two possibilities. One is the classification and another one is the evaluation. And then the, there is a difference what you currently do with those positions, classify or evaluate. If you evaluate, then you get the right... Uh, right uh, point value if you classify then the mistake or the plus minus can be bigger but let's have it afterwards but good that you are implementing now <laughs> i will go to that screen uh so the my topic is uh oh, sorry. yeah the microphone my topic is the soft part it is the hard part which is very much about the salaries and about incentives but if we could just pay the salaries and uh, keep uh, everything else apart, then that would be a nice, nice world, but it's not true. So I will talk about the global trends and expectations of employees. So there is not only topic about the salaries, but also about some other very important things. So why it's not working? I don't know because the next picture is about the students. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. It's not cooperating with me. Just to switch on. No. <laughs> no, it it, it 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 is your clicker. It was my clicker for my presentation now. Is it know. RBS clicker? You, you see how complicated <laughs> it is. It was my presentation with your clicker. I already did it. Yeah. Yeah, I already did it. So that I have learned. <laughs> Everybody learns that. Oh, no, it's working. No, it's uh, with the mouse, but still. No, it's also working here. Okay, go. good. So I promised. <laughs> It's a technical university in the picture, and those are IT students, actually. Um, the first uh, first uh, year students, uh, the picture is taken on 20th uh, September. Some of the students are sleeping. Some of the students are listening to the tutor. Uh, but uh, my task actually was to tell uh, the new generation about the salary situation in the market and especially about the IT market. So my first question was, do you know that the IT positions are the best 
paid positions in in the market so everybody was like yes we know my second question was have you chosen the the study uh it because of this market position and almost all the hands raised up again so this is kind of the tendency what is currently happening the students know that the salary will be good but still more structured structured question from uh, to the uh, to the students and also more structured answers uh, from from the students what would be a value uh, what would you what would the student value the most when choosing my next employer so this is the first year students most probably uh none of them or some of them uh has the first employer uh, but still these blue lines actually those uh says something about the salary this is the fair reward practice and also uh possibility to uh, accumulate some funds for the future those four first columns are not for the salary so it shows that the other things are as important at least as the salary so opportunity for year uh, progression and growth job that gives satisfaction opportunity for learning new skills and opportunity to balance work and other activities in the life so this is what actually uh, students already say that th this is important if i'm comparing the same statistics with the previous year in the first place there was a salary in the last why did it so huh? <laughs> you know <laughs> <laughs> and in the last place, uh, there was a manager's role in their lives. So in this year, kind of uh, this uh, switched a bit on a different way. We see some soft parts uh, in the first place. And in the last place, we see the support for healthy lifestyle. So this survey was done 20 uh, September 2022. Yes, more, more than 300, uh, uh, 325 students in the room. Yep. And then if we are moving uh, out uh, of the school, but uh, moving actually to the some real uh, some some uh, real work environment, then actually the pandemic years change a lot uh, how people are thinking about their work. And uh, quite significant, quite fundamental questions uh, people were start to ask, uh, like, do I want to work at all? Do I consider that this particular company is the right company for me? Uh, do I see that this profession actually is the, my profession, what I, I would like to do in, in, in my uh, life? How I can balance out the work and also the other things in my life. And all these questions uh, led actually to one thing, what is also shown in the, in the graph here is the voluntary uh, employee turnover. So I'm deciding to leave my job, my company. And what you can see that we have a drop here, it's a Baltic results, three Baltic countries. We have a drop in 20 and 21 pandemic years, and then it goes up for all three Baltic countries. So it's a tendency uh, across the Baltic and not only uh, across the Baltic countries that uh, people are quite easily going away from the positions, from the jobs, from the companies. And this is what we call uh, great res resignation this is the common um, wording or, or common name across the globe. Uh, when during the pandemic, people understood that they are not happy with the, with the industry, with the company, with the position, with the work-life balance, and just left the job. Have you heard about it? Yes, you have. Good. Uh, the reasons, the reasons why people do so why people did so 77 percent still this is a question about a salary uh, people understand that somewhere out there is a possibility to get the higher salary 55 percent absolutely personal reasons starting with i do not like this job anymore 
Then again, leaving 40%, uh, leaving for a different role in the same industry. And here you can see 28 leaving for a different industry. So the switch between the industries actually is happening in the market. Uh, burnout and exhaustion, 36%. So quite a big number there. And some other topics, lack, lack of uh, possibility to have this flexible schedules, for example, leaving uh, because um, having ability to get the better benefits package as well. So these are uh, uh, not the top ones, but, but still very important. So what has changed? The question is here, why those people are acting, uh, acting why they start to act during the pandemics? Uh, um, that way. And the question actually, or the answer is a bit uh, bigger than just the digitalization or possibility to work remotely or, or some other topics. It's a fundamental shift of uh, social contract. Who has studied uh, philosophy or who has studied um, politics science have heard about social contract uh, uh, concept, but uh, putting it very, very simple, um, these are a unwritten agreement between two social parties. In this case, we have employees and employers. And these are unwritten rules between those two parties. And if we are looking back in the history, and it's not far away in the history, it's some 20 years ago, then the social contract was very, very, very simple. It was quite transactional. I, me, employee, giving my time, producing some result, and we are expecting back some basic needs, pay, benefit, security. Then if you are looking back before the pandemic, we all remember that we should engage employees, motivate employees. We got the new concept, motivational engagement contract. And then this um, expectations from the employees side was already broader, still the pay, still the benefits, but also career, experience, possibility to learn, to gain more knowledge. This was already expected from the employee's side. And then suddenly what has happened? Pandemic came. And somehow we started to rethink that, hmm, is the work the main uh, reason why I'm living, let's say so. And uh, we entered in a new social contract mm, and well-being started to be very, very important. So the healthy experience uh, from the employee's side uh, was uh, expected to, to get from the employer. And uh, this was how the employee was um, about to commit also for the organizational renewal. And currently we are going out of this phase and uh, almost facing new uh, social contract, which is a lifestyle contract or in the focus, we have the energizing uh, concept, let's say so. So the employee actually uh, is expecting the total reward, which consists not only of the pay, of the benefits, of the growth, but actually uh, expects also flexibility and this uh, possibility for the future employ employability. This is how the thinking behind actually has changed. Do you recognize that? I will take a water. Or not, not at all. You're saying, mm-mm. Everybody's keeping silence, so I will move on. Because there are some data also that shows that uh, people are changing their minds. And um, so the, the global survey, this is the survey what Edi was uh, at the very beginning telling uh, Mercer Global uh, Talent Trends uh, has measured what was important for employees to stay within the company on 2020. It's a early 2020 before the pandemic started and uh, the same measurement done this year. So uh, blue bubbles, goes for the 2020, the lilac bubbles bubbles goes for, uh, for 2022. What has not changed, changed job security. So people really value job security. And it's about not signing the papers that the, the brick will not fall on our heads, but it, it's about um, that I am having a job today, we'll have tomorrow and hopefully after a month and after a year. What has shifted 
flexibility to work from home. On 2020, it was on the 17th place. This year, it's on the second place. The next one, competitive pay. Yes, still very important, has dropped one place, but fair reward practices, something very new, what, what is important for employees on 2022. So not only competitive, good salary, but also fair. The next breakout, vacation and time off policies from the 20 place back on 2020, now it's on the fifth place. So the free time, flexibility on my personal time. Medical insurance from 11th to 6th, so importance for the employees are growing uh, for the medical insurance and quite natural. We saw how fragile actually the uh, health can be. So the uh, any support for the health um, is valued from employees. And then two things, what has dropped in the, in the top, opportunity for a career progression and opportunity for pers personal growth and learning from fourth and third place to seven and eight. So we can see that actually the flexibility and our, our uh, time, uh, our free time has like risen on the top while the career and um, professional growth and learning has dropped. So we are changing how we feel about the jobs. Yes. Yes. For career, uh, when you start to, to learn something, of course it is important. For the first year students, definitely. Uh, but there is a one trick how actually the managers are reading this slide. They are saying, aha, they still want to have a good salary, but they do not want to learn. They do not want to, to step up in a career. They want to have the spare time and not to go to the work. Actually, they do not want to work anymore, but this is not true. This is what you shouldn't read from the slide. Uh, people still want to learn. We will talk about the, the employability in the future, but the role actually, this, the, this learning studies and the learning point actually is a bit different. So, but still people want to work. And then, but uh, people want to balance out the, the, the work and the other activities. Yes, or totally no. Iri already mentioned about this concept uh, from the managing to partnering. I will not uh, go a bit, um, go uh, deep in that, but still fair, transparent and mutual beneficial relations. This is what is expected. Uh, this boss and subordinate uh, relations doesn't work anymore. People uh, expect to be on the same level with an employer. And uh, people want to uh, work with the company, not for the company anymore. And to get that concept in the place, actually what we do, we um, get uh, rid of some control actually. And uh, when we are talking about the flexibility and uh, all uh, this remote thing, this is about letting go some of the control. And um, these are data from the global uh, research again, what companies has done differently on this remote topic during the 2020 and 21. And 36% uh, of the companies across the globe, and this is done across the globe, has introduced opportunity for employees to work four day uh, week, this compressed week. 47% uh, uh, has adopted talent attraction strategies. Uh, they are using not only their normal or regular working contracts, contracts, but also freelance workers and gig workers, for example. And this is something uh, which is different in Latvia. When we are talking about the flexibility, we are usually talking uh, when to work and where to work. Uh, but there are three more dimensions. Uh, actually, there are who works, what, uh, what is the job, what is done, and how this is done. So the three more dimensions ac actually is under the uh, flexibility form. And uh, more than 50% of the companies has asked their employees, of course, how do they think uh, how they can be the most um, efficient. 
uh, has adopted also the working spaces. Hybrid work or the remote work also brings some changes uh, in this area. And 54% has legalized uh, the, the flexibility and remote work. And let's say what has happened in Baltics. Uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania on the screen, compressed work week, just said 23%, yes, or even more, 34% of the companies across the globe has introduced that and um, give that possibility for their employees. In the Baltics, this is not popular at all. So you can see for all positions, two, two, and three percent of the companies are uh, giving that op opportunity for employees. For some employees, six, nine, three percent across, uh, most of the companies are not using that. And this tendency, I was surprised that also IT companies are not having a huge numbers there. So this comes from the general market, but also IT is not like having the 50 percent of the IT companies are not doing that. Uh, still flexible work schedules uh, and remote work is the most popular, popular forms what we are using across the Baltics. Huge topic about the hybrid work. How many days per week I should be in the office and how many days uh, I can work from home or how many days I let my employees work from home and how many days I let them be in the office. So two days per week across the Baltic. Uh, this is how many days uh, per week, um, employees are allowed to work remotely. Lot, not lot. If you think that the, all of all companies has already uh, this on this hybrid work uh, stage, this is not true. In the Baltics, we have the companies who are just starting to consider to introduce remote work or uh, hybrid work, and there are companies who are trying to get their employees at least one day in the office back. So there is a huge difference between the companies. Uh, compensation for the remote work, also hot, uh, hot topic. Who is compensating uh, all the utility costs, internet costs, let's say also heating at home uh, when, when the um, job is done remotely. And then you can see quite the same tendency across the, the Baltics. 89, 83, 92% of the companies are not compensating. Why Why not compensating? Well, how, what do you think? What's the most popular answer? Why should I? <laughs> the most frequent answer actually is it's an empl employee's choice to be remote. Yes. Uh, but if the um, if the costs are compensated, then you can see the the amounts per month what is compensated. So Latvia thirty two uh, euros, uh, Estonia, Lithuania, higher amounts. Why we are talking so much about the hybrid work? How do you, what do you think? Because there is a huge gap between how the executives think about the uh, remote work and how employees feel about uh, the remote work. Executives, what they say, 78% uh, are concerned about the relationship uh, between the employees and also between the employees and the management. This is the main concern, how you build the relationship uh, on this in this remote uh, mood. Then the 75% actually are considered about um, learning culture, how we learn from each other. When somebody is sitting just opposite me, it's quite easy to tick with the finger and say that you are doing wrong, let's try another way. When you are like doing this remotely, there should be some a bit forced uh, actions, how the people learn from each other. And then 72% and more, uh, once more 72%, uh, quite interesting, 72% of the executives are concerned about uh, how employees will uh, get promoted or how their work will be like noticed in the company. So this is about the performance management, how we tar set the targets, how we follow up the targets, how actually we evaluate, uh, evaluate our employees. And then, uh, of course, 72% uh, are considered about the culture. If you are considering, uh, if you are worried about how the how you are building the relationships, sooner or later you start to worry also about the culture. 
So this is on the executive side. Employees, 76% of employees believe, believe that um, they have the same opportunities. Uh, doesn't matter wh whether they are working uh, remotely, whether they are working in the office. 74% believes that their management actually is very into the remote work, that the, the, the management supports remote work. Uh, some more 74% uh, uh, actually believe that the company is benefit, benefiting from the possibility uh, for the employees work uh, remotely. And more than a half is like enjoying the, the remote uh, work on 100%. So you can see that the, the, there is a quite quite a gap between how how the remote work or the hybrid work, where is the juice? Somewhere there. <laughs> and because... Uh, the remote work or the hybrid work will not go away. This is for sure. Uh, the The question is how we are like balancing those uh, both parts out. You just assume that executives are not working remotely. Uh, they are working, but they are worried more. Actually, might be, might be. But uh, many of the executives during the pandemic actually considered to be uh, at the office just to keep that uh, grip and control what's happening. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Not in this particular slides, but yes, there are also researches on that. We will come to some other slides, so I will show you what, what is uh, more concerning uh, even about the produ uh, produ productivity. Well-being. You were like told that I will talk about the well-being, and I will. Total employee well-being. Uh, before the pandemics, this was the first time when we started to hear about the well-being. And uh, there is a shift, again, what's happening during uh, those two years. Previously, and previously is um, 2019, approximately. Uh, the focus was on reducing costs for, uh, costs for uh, employer, um, employers related to employee health issues. So the employee is physically healthy. He can come to work. He can produce the result. Company gets the income. Everybody's happy. So that, that was the approach, healthy employee. During the pandemics, what we saw that not only the physical health is important, also this mental health is very, very important. Uh, so currently the focus is changing from um, protecting the welfare and employee, uh, not only on today, but also in the future. We are trying to teach our um, uh, employees how to be healthy on many aspects. And uh, which has changed. Uh, I talk, uh, told about the physical and mental health. Actually, we are widening this well-being concept even more wider. We are talking about the social uh, well-being and we are talking about the financial well-being for health. So also those dimensions, those aspects can significantly impact how the employee is feeling. And employers are working also on those, those issues. And again, uh, well, healthy working habits. We are trying to get to back on track that we are not overworking, we are not exhausted, we are not uh, uh, having burnouts, that we are still trying to be healthy. And one more thing. Uh, some years ago, it was a concept that if you are working in the company, you are getting the, the basket of the benefits. Currently, it goes quite on the opposite side. Uh, the benefits, the, the everything what you give for the employee uh, must be quite individualized. Understanding what is particular situation of this employee and what is needed for this employee. Some skeptical views on that? Yes, it, it brings a huge administration with that. You, you should know each and every employee and understand how to administer that. Budgets. What is the benefit budget in the Baltics for employee per year? Latvians lag behind. 831, while uh, benefits in, in a benefit basket in Lithuania and also in um, Estonia is uh, more than 1,000 euros. Sorry? 
No, no, it's a it's a cost what what the companies are reporting, and what is usually in team events, corporate events, sports, health, pension, catering, and some other smaller. But those six ones are like uh, combining the the most uh, part of of that um, of that benefit basket. And this is the Latvian uh, top uh, benefits what we have in 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 the in this benefit baskets. So, entertainment is the top one benefit what we are produ um, delivering to our employees. That the next one tangible one is the health insurance has always been on 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 the very upper upper uh, scale there. Then presents allowances Latvians like allowances. Food and beverages at uh, workplace, accident insurance, something uh, what is different from um, other two Baltic countries. You will not see that in uh, top 10 benefits. Bonus for attracting new employees. That means that if the existing employee brings somebody new in the company, you pay some amount for, for that uh, um, old employee who uh, brought the new, new, new one in. Discounts for the products and services uh, provided by organization more health benefits and sports benefits. This is how the top 10 looks like in Latvia. When you are like trying to unify the benefit baskets across the Baltics, uh, look what the baskets actually are in, in, three, uh, in three different Baltic countries. Because of the legislation, because of the some different uh, situations in the health field, for example, the benefits are different. Time off, you you will have those slides, we will share, but we are also giving some additional time off. So you will see what are those typical reasons why we are uh, giving those days uh, for employees and what are those amounts approximately. But I will not like, uh, when you are going on the winter vacation. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's usually between the um, Christmas and the New Year or after the New Year, uh, there is some period where nobody is working at, at the office or in, in, the, in the company. So uh, ballerina slides and uh, ballerina slides goes for the future employability. Uh, I, I was already telling that it is still important actually to study to learn to get some knowledge uh, new knowledge in why 91 percent of, of employees are saying that they recently has acquired new skills while 98 percent of the companies are still reporting that there is a significant uh, skill gap so people are learning but the employers are still saying that it's not enough and the uh, obsolescence of knowledge uh, is the one of the top 10 um, human risks across the globe, that what we currently know gets outdated very, very fast. And those 91, 98% actually uh, shows that. What we learn today or what we know today is already uh, outdated tomorrow. Uh, what employees are doing, they're currently not only investing in the current needs, or in the needs what is uh, essential for the business continuity, but also uh, try to guess and try to predict what will be needed uh, in the nearest future. Uh, lifelong long learning. This is where we currently are. Uh, we are learning from each other now, but uh, really not only bachelor, master, or what we have done uh, in, a, in a very early ages, uh, we are learning all the time. Skills are the two currency of the labor market. Yes, it is. If you have the, the skills, what's needed currently or will be needed in the future, uh, definitely you can negotiate also the salary. It didn't show the uh, market lines for the ICT sector currently, but it stands out for, for quite far away from the general market. Uh, so, uh, yes. And about uh, the concepts or the strategies, how we are closing that gap. Uh, 
before the pandemics, this is also what has changed during the pandemics. Before the pandemics, top one strategy, how we close the, the gap or how we acquired those skills, what is needed from the company, we, bought, we were buying skills, meaning that we knew that somebody in the market has those skills and we were just hiring that person. Currently, it's only on the first place. So it's not the top, uh, top one strategy, how we are closing that gap in the company. We are trying to targeting... Uh, uh, Target uh, huh, targeting the learning, meaning that we are like targeting uh, those skills, what's needed in the company, and we are giving those skills or trying to acquire those skills within our employees. Um, some more uh, what we are doing, using rotation, short-term projects, internal gigs. So we are uh, getting that knowledge within the company. Then the third one, what companies are doing um, switching the employees between the companies. So you are using the partners, suppliers, customers, when you are putting your employee in, in, in that company and the uh, employee sees the process or the product from the other side. And this is where the innovations usually comes in. So the employee comes with the big eyes and knows how, how, how actually the, the work, uh, the, the life works. And then what already Iria mentioned, uh, we are rewarding skills. Not only once per year the salary review happens, but when the employee uh, get that knowledge and can utilize in, in the company, you uh, adjust the salary. What happens uh, during the crisis usually, uh, training budget is the one who is cut one of the first ones. And uh, what we see still here, that uh, this is not the case. Uh, from the total HR budgets, two to three percent actually uh, goes for the training, uh, and uh, companies still increase the budgets or do not change, keep the same amount. So this learning part is quite important from all sides. Yes. Yes. I will for innovation process. Do people want to? I think that's the part of our uh, daily jobs, actually, to innovate something because the uh, if you will put the aim for employee, most probably to innovate or to get some uh, new knowledge in, then definitely it will be there. No, we are not looking into uh, in that particular part, but we will come to the correlation or expectations on the technologies what the employees have that that will follow yes i think yes we will move on with janis and then um, defense force trainings this is also something what is happening but i will uh keep some intrigue here and uh, we will I will go with Jans because I, I like to talk a lot and Lydia already talked a lot about <laughs> many so topics. Let's, let's try let's let's uh, try to get Janis on yes. online, yeah? Is it okay? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Yanni, are you? Mm -hmm. uh, Hello. <laughs> ah, you are here, so we we yeah. we see you, yeah. I will uh, share the screen in a moment. Uh huh. I think that you should be able to do that. Yes. Uh, do you see the presentation now? Yes. Can you can you put it on a on a wider screen because we see with the notes. 
Oh, okay. I'm not used to using Zoom, so I'm not sure how to how to speak. Do, do, do you have two? Do you have two screens? Yeah. Ah, and yeah. Should I? Oh, okay. Uh, usually, usually I have two screens. Uh, yeah. Well done. You were okay. quick me I... explaining. Yeah, floor is yours. Okay. Yeah. So first of all, hello to all alumni. I'm sorry that I wasn't able to make it today live, but uh, I hope you hear me well. Uh, so basically, Iria and the Christiana talked, said a lot of numbers, but uh, what I will uh, tell will be more uh, conceptual, and uh, I will try to catch the essence of those topics. So basically, I'm going to divide uh, my presentation in three parts. The first one is uh, how do we become more data driven? Uh, it will be followed up by uh, oh, sorry, it will be followed up by how to how do we monetize the data, and uh, conclude with uh, how do we use data science in the real world. Um, so basically. Uh, before diving into how do we become more data driven, we need to define the data literacy because in our days it's um, the data is a valuable asset and um, people need to start speaking data. Uh, what do I mean by speaking? Uh, the data literacy can be simply defined as the ability to read, write, uh, communicate data in the proper business context, as well as the analytical methods and uh, uh, techniques applied to describe uh, <clears throat> and the ability to describe the use cases for the, for its application. Uh, while usually the executives uh, understand the concepts of people, process, and technology, uh, they usually disregard data since it should be in the center of all of these dimensions. Um, so, yeah, the, you can ask yourself, do you speak data? Because uh, it will become increasingly more important. Uh, so basically, how to, how, to, how to put it all in the framework? There are so many different frameworks. Everyone's talking about data, but uh, cannot give substantiated reasoning why it's uh, important and uh, why do we need it. So uh, first of all, we need to ask ourselves the question, does data-driven concept even make sense uh, in, in the, this is widely used term, I would say in the industry. However, the business is not driven by data, the business is driven by insights. So more appropriate um, wording would be insight-driven organization or insight-driven processes. Um, so previously we had data, someone analyzed it, we gain insights and then we do some actions. But actually in today's world, because of the volume, velocity, variety of the data, we need a single framework that encompasses all of this architecture. And, uh, and uh, Gartner, these frameworks which I'm showing related uh, to data-driven organization are Gartner frameworks. And uh, this one architecture, but Gartner tells it must encompass uh, data acquisition, which could be like in any form. Uh, then we have to organize the data in so it makes sense. And uh, then we analyze already the organized data and the end product of this analysis uh, are delivery of the insights or uh, the results. So, uh, Based on these four steps, Gartner proposes it a bit for uh, a bit more advanced view uh, to not over confuse you. Basically, this acquiring uh, it contains of any data sources what can come in your mind. It could be videos, it could be text, it could be different databases. Uh, then this whole data must be organized in a cluster, if I may say, and then be, based on this organization, we can make some analysis, which can be further delivered to the clients as analytical dashboards, as uh, visual, visual explorations, advanced analytics, etc. But the main idea is that 
all uh, data and analytics have a comprehensive architecture. Um, I, I will uh, give um, I will give example uh, a bit later uh, during the presentation. Uh, but basically, to decrease the complexity of these topics, uh, let's focus simply on analyzing stage, which usually which usually for the end users or for not so data tech savvy people are uh, the most uh, most um, the topic which uh, which is the most important uh, so focusing on this analyzing uh, component it can be further divided uh, into what Gartner calls uh, for analytical capabilities and uh, the range of availabilities um, go well beyond traditional uh, data reporting and analysis, what we usually see in uh, uh, nowadays in organizations. It, to, I'm talking specifically about Baltics. In other parts of the world, this has already been developed uh, a bit more further, but let's focus uh, mainly on uh, Bal uh, Baltics. Uh, so we have human-centric, human-centered analytics and machine-centered uh, machine analytics. And basically the goal is to shift uh, the workload from humans to machines so that the machines are doing most of this job. Uh, so we have these four analytical capabilities, which are descriptive diagnostic. Currently in the Baltics, I would say that uh, still uh, we lack some uh, it's automation. Uh, it's both automation capabilities and uh, the understanding of data in general. But uh, to keep it uh, simple, we have these four analytical capabilities. Uh, and pre uh, predictive and prescriptive are the ones which are currently, I would say, as a black box. And organizations are trying to understand how to automate these practices and what do they even mean. Um, so based on these four capabilities, uh, they can be also translated into analytical environment. Um, so we have this analyze component, which can be translated into these four main questions for analytical capabilities, which can be further translated into analytics environment. And um, the first question, what we, what we tried to answer was uh, what happened so it's descriptive statistics and analytics environment. In analytics environment, this would refer to information, information portal, which would be basic uh, reporting skills, uh, dashboards, etc. cetera. Uh, then the next question, which we're trying to answer is why did it happen? And usually it uh, should go through this analytics uh, workbench uh, where the goal is to be agile and insightful rather than having these static reports. Uh, the third element is a data science laboratory, where basically you make different machine learning models and incorporate it into the whole business process or whole business. Um, and the artificial intelligence hub, which in nowadays, uh, I would say is not, uh, in, in Baltics, it's not automat automatized at all. Uh, some organizations do uh, have all of these practices a bit more advanced, but I'm talking in general. Uh, this is basically decision-making that uh, instead of humans are making decisions, we bring this responsibility to, to, to the machines. Um, so actually the current state of data, they, uh, data analytics and uh, BI, BI is a term for data science. They can be used interchangeably. Uh, that basically currently we are, we have mainly, uh, we, we had processes uh, where the main emphasis was on monitoring on this information portal where we have these static reports and it doesn't really provide any insights if we are not looking at some specific places. Uh, where what is the state beyond 2020? Currently, we are in 2022. Uh, however, the Gartner, I think, predicted uh, a bit uh, wrongly uh, because uh, we still have a way to go 
uh, to achieve uh, this kind of performance that basically that analytics are uh, driven by machines instead of uh, humans. So the impact on the organizations would be tra transformative. It means that the organizations change the way they work, they change, the, they change their processes and uh, also the tools, what they use. Uh, but this, uh, this industry is uh, ever evolving and the new tools and practices uh, are coming up every day. And um, it's just a matter of time when we get to this stage where all the analytical process is brought to the machines instead of humans with only, of course, few trigger, uh, trigger points. Um, and yeah, going back to this analytical and uh, analytics environment where we encompass all these four questions uh, related to what has happened, uh, why did it happen, what will happen, basically descriptive, um, diagnostic, predictive, and prescriptive analytics, uh, which encompasses these four uh, components in the analytics environment. So how can we deal with the chaos of uh, uh, so much data, so much things to see uh, and explore? Basically, Al also Gartner proposes to put all these four analytical capabilities which, which creates this analytical environment as a self-service. And what do I mean by self-service? I will just uh, mention example uh, uh, of self-service uh, in our organization, uh, how, how it is in figure. So uh, basically we have a portal for one place where uh, all the results uh, stand. Uh, clients, they are able to download basic reports, uh, which does not, automatically give you these insights and uh, maybe not as big analytical capability as you would have uh, if you just have access to the data set as a whole. So um, what, uh, what we have done, we brought this analytical part uh, to the customers, that the customers, uh, they are able to analyze the data themselves. And uh, this moves from this um, uh, more monitoring process of the of a data environment to the more analytical uh, process where we involve the users. Of course, at this stage, we must take into the consideration how, uh, like, uh, how tech savvy is the user, how he understands and interprets the data and uh, what additionally we can include or exclude to improve this uh, understanding of the data. Um, but as far as we have implemented uh, these practices, we have received actually quite good feedback from the clients. So there are people who wants to, de who wants to work more with data and uh, uh, we need to bring this capability more to the hands of users. Uh, so yeah, basically what I, all the points I just mentioned, we can uh, just set priorities. Uh, the first one is just to design and build this end-to-end -end data and, and, and analytics architecture. Um, then uh, just to enable analytics to go truly viral, uh, we have to, uh, this is also part of the self-service self uh, BI solutions. And uh, also, as I mentioned, this volume, variety, and velocity of data, uh, we need to incorporate the cloud as the core element uh, since it can deal with uh, all these big Vs. Uh, and the last point for, to catch is, uh, anyway, we will need to expand these roles and skill sets uh, the, they are uh, quite business specific, but we, we we will we have a need to expand these uh, skill sets uh, both for internal and external business ecosystems. Uh, what I just showed you it was basically a external ecosystem for them for them for our users. Uh, the next topic, Yanni, Yanni, yes. do, do do you hear me? 
Yes, it's I so do. it's so it's so strange uh, to to talk with someone whom you don't see. Um, yes, Yanni, I was I was suggested by by Christiana that we could uh, now sum it up a bit and try to get uh, you, Christiana and Iria, for the for the questions because we are uh, slightly over time um, mm -hmm. because of very energetic presentations. So uh, is it is it okay for you, or maybe just giving you some two three minutes to to finalize the presentation and invite Christiana the, to to, okay. to catch the the questions? Yeah, if it's yes, okay. Sure. With you. Thank you uh, very much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, basically, I covered one of the topics, one of three topics which which I wanted to cover. But just to sum up, the next topic, what I wanted to talk was how to monetize the data. And basically, we have three ways to monetize the data. The first one would be to improve the internal business processes, which is the most fast and uh, fast way how we can uh, monetize data. And uh, this is basically um, uh, a scientific paper which proves the impact of the of the business processes towards the organizational performance. So if we improve our business processes, we monetize the data, not directly as a monetary value, but uh, as a driver. Uh, the second part of uh, the second uh, way how we can monetize data is wrap information around the products. Just to give an idea what it means, the use case of FedEx was that they have this online package, uh, they, they have this packaging ser service where they deliver packages. <laughs> and in the beginning of 90s, they basically implemented this online package tracking, which is the basically wrapping the information around the products. Um, and the, th the third way, how can we monetize data, which is the actually the toughest part to achieve is that we actually sell the data. Uh, the business should be uh, based, based on selling data or you have to find some competitive advantage, which is not currently available in the market. Uh, yes, as an example, I can uh, mention, as I mentioned us, uh, I wanted to say something more, but just to get an idea that we are selling data and it is hard to replicate. And how can we use data science in the real world? I will not be able to um, describe this, to this topic in such short time, but to ju just get the general understanding, the data science usually can uh, deal with the questions what most of the people cannot answer. Uh, during the Christiana Sanirius presentation, I heard a lot of questions is, okay, uh, for example, the forecast, uh, what would be the salary increase in two years? Currently, we, we could just make a guesses or ask for these forecasts for organizations in this case, but this is actually a task for uh, machine learning and we can solve this issue. Let's say we can predict salary increases for the next two years of course, with some uh, certain prediction accuracy. And uh, yes, that, that science, they can solve multiple kinds of tasks which are related usually to regression classification or clustering. But of course, these are hard concepts and uh, without, without examples, I will not be able to say that much that it makes sense to you actually. But um, yes, the data science usually follows this cycle and uh, the cycle, uh, in um, it's quite similar in different papers, but it catches the main essence. That basically, we first need to understand, then we need to scrape all the data from these different sources, which was mentioned in this architecture. Then we have to clean the data, where we have to take into account how to deal with the missing values, uh, how to deal with the outliers in the data. Then we, uh, then. Uh, we go to the data exploration where we find some maybe additional insights. Feature engineering and predictive modeling; these are two main. These are two uh, fields which are, I would say, I would say uh, directly related to data science because rest of the steps they can be executed by data analysts. But feature engineering and predictive modeling; those ones uh, need some data sci science capabilities, more specifically machine learning. But yeah, you. I guess you will have also access to this presentation. I have some examples also for each of these uh, machine learning types, regression classification and clustering. But just to get the main essence, the regression deals with numbers. Classification deals with predicting proper categories, which could be spam filters or customer behavior. And uh, 
also the clustering deals with uh, this um, basically putting putting data into groups. Um, Netflix suggestions, you get Netflix suggestions based on algorithm that puts you in a cluster. Uh, that would be really in short uh, about um, both data monetization and data science life cycles. These concepts are a bit heavy and uh, it's yeah. not yeah, possible yeah, I mean, to catch all this. Thank, thank you, thank time. you, thank you very much for yeah. for for your introduction. C can I yeah. ask now uh, to uh, switch to 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 the mood that we see you as well? Um, oh, can't you see me now? Okay. You just need to you just need to stop sharing the screen. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, are there any questions uh, to to Christiana, Iria, and and uh, Janis? Janis is doing all the things. Yes, and he can talk about it. Me and Eric can talk about the, the market hours, and we are passionate about it too. But mm -hmm. data. And so, so, so any questions? You 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 can use the time as as you want now. I have a question. I will give you a mic so that uh, as we are recording, so that people hear your fantastic question. Hey, Christiana, a uh, big part of your presentation was based on some sort of global study. And my question, how, how much it's relevant to Baltics? I was trying to combine actually the global yeah, I, with I've the got... Baltics. Uh, let's say sooner or later the global event appears. Two years, three years in the pandemic, it happened just like that. Actually, uh, sooner or later, yes, those trends are coming here. What we saw, for example, about the compressed portion of the companies across the globe uh, is more widely offering the possibility. Um, but it's not yet. Let's see what happens in the future. But still, if you have the customer in front of you, you cannot say that we are working for four days. Uh, so it, it, it depends on the market where we are operating. And also the four-day concept for, uh, th there has been a discussion how to implement the four-day uh, concept for, uh, across the, the country. It's quite expensive as well. So it depends. But uh, overall, I would say the global trends are coming. But we are like a market. Okay, thank you. Somebody else? Yeah, yeah, because that's very interesting. What's going? What's happening with productivity and? Uh... This is one that's quite concerning one. So in the future, employees do not want to come to the work and lose the energy. They want to get from the work life energy as well. Uh, what we saw during the pandemics, there are two tendencies. The level of the energy went down so for the employees and the possibility to get the burnout or exhaustion went up. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 there was a question or, or, or the assumption and the remote work actually reduced the productivity. Yes, it was so. Because we were like mm, spending quite a lot of the time um uh, in communication telling you what you should do then getting back the information what's been done then you are giving that information to the next employee that took quite a lot of time and uh, i think that we are still learning how to how to work remotely or how to combine this remote and on-site working so but this productivity issue definitely is there because of the communication one part yes, yes. There is also loyalty, which is loyalty, which is uh, being lost more during the ah. remote. Well, no, even inside the team, yeah, even inside the team, yes, sure. Well, that's why those executives are so different. Mm -hmm. Still, we are quite happy about it. So, so we have some problem balance out of the parts. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. so uh, that people were concerned uh, that if I work remotely, will my performance be uh, kind of measured uh, on on uh, on a good way? Do people notice how much I contribute? So yes, it's it's a new world and. Uh, Somehow, uh, we are not so good at uh, compressed work here in the Baltics, but we are very good at uh, flexible uh, and remote working. And uh, I would say that it's more a question for those companies uh, which has production and customer service and where you cannot uh, offer this remote work and flexibility uh, in all roles. So how to increase in uh, equality inside organizations because you don't want a production company to speak that, uh, oh, they on the second floor do nothing because they are never here, but they are working from home. But we are a production workers, we have to produce here and we, we, we don't have any kind of freedom to choose. So how to, how to increase flexibility there as well. But in general, if we look at the service, for example, Fonta service 10 years ago, then the flexibility in terms of place and time it was there, but not for all employees, but uh, some employees. Probably it's a bad difference between both and this special area. We are slightly behind the names of the photographs. How do you, let's say, see the future about that? So, so the question was about the differences between countries, so that the viewers understand the question. Thank you. I, I think uh, the future is bright because it's always easier to increase than to decrease. And uh, every country which has more employees compared to Estonia is doing well. And uh, from another hand, I mean, um, no, Lithuania has, has caught up. Estonia has had a uh, higher salary level and more kinds of equal distribution. We don't have so big managers because our companies are smaller and we pay more for, for blue collar roles. But it has also been a problem for Estonian market uh, because uh, everything is so expensive uh, in terms of labor costs. But Lithuania has increased over the couple of two years. And, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, the average salary in Lithuania and in Estonia was quite the same. But of course, uh, tax uh, tax uh, kind of policy changes the picture. And and uh, in Estonia, the net amount is bigger, which person receives. I th it's it's like uh, each country has uh, like uh, I think we are quite equal. And uh, for example, for some decade, uh, maybe some countries better, maybe Estonia went better off uh, due to Finnish neighborhood and due to right decisions in terms of privatization that we, we started off faster. So Skype has uh, nurtured our uh, IT sector, almost all startups, those unicorns, we have five or six by now, they have uh, Skype, uh, Skype, uh, Roots, so it, it was like Estonian development kind of uh, credit like an advantage. Lithuania is a bigger country, uh, much more opportunities. In a way, also um, the number of industries is bigger. What what kind of uh, they have like quite a package of things what is possible to do in Lithuania. Now Latvia maybe is a little bit withdrawn at the moment, but but not so much. And I guess just. Uh, Changes what you have seen now uh, in in your in your like environment uh, they all support your your past uh, kinds of recovery and catch up but somebody has to be above and somebody has to be <laughs> below and it changes positions so yeah I will I will see that uh, the bigger the country in terms of uh, people. Uh, skilled uh, people, uh, the better the position for the country, actually, in, in the future. Yeah. Any, any other questions? No? I will address the bit back to that question regarding last year. Do you feel that there are differences between those of the country countries? Uh, if you look on, let's say, uh, India. Iria, can you try to, 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 
Okay. Pass the mic. Can I throw it? Be careful. Super. No, I, I think uh, maybe from uh, employment perspective, yes, if, if you can see some job at, uh, you can see that, for example, if you will be employed in Estonia or Lithuania, your salary, let's say, will be different. But uh, from another point of view, uh, I don't know, I, I have heard that some people get employed by, by neighbor countries, but they are still living in Latvia. So I don't know. I think we are, let's it's. I would say that uh, our neighbor countries, it's not so far away and uh, probably, yeah, maybe it's, yeah. But I would like to see your comment on this as well. Mm -hmm. Christiana? I will just on the feelings, not on the numbers, but on the feelings. And uh, the first, actually, this was the first year where we did the, the survey on a very same ground for all three Baltic countries. So those uh, numbers, what we get out is really comparable. They're the same approach, the same methodology, or everything the same. And I was a bit surprised that those numbers for Latvia, like a benefit basket, like a salary, we see that the salary trend line is also below. So it gives a bit of the feeling that we are somewhere lacking behind. But the problem with Latvians has been, I think, always that we are somewhere in between, like the country is situated somewhere in between, that this is what we, how we are also acting. We are looking on Estonians. Yes, they are doing good things. They are behind of us. Then there's somewhere where, where the, the feeling that Lithuanians are not doing so good. But actually, the resource-wise, they has the larger resources in the country and they are currently developing and they are moving faster um forward so yes it's a bit about also about the attitude what we have in the country this struggling attitude i would say and um, i have um uh, i have like 13 years of experience in compensation and uh, for example, some positions were definitely uh, paid higher in Latvia, um, and and it's still so. If if we if you look at uh, job families, I mean, uh, distributed by function. So if we take marketing, for example, then Latvia was in the middle, which is good, which means uh, four hours on on both uh, sides. So uh, marketing positions, companies started to. Uh, build uh, their offices to to Latvia instead of having also employees in in Estonia and Lithuania, then uh, some sales positions. Then of course also those pharmaceuticals. Uh, Latvia has bigger sample compared to Estonia. If if companies started to um, centralize things, then Latvia was uh, very often the, the the location which was chosen. So it, in, in terms of job families, uh, it, it also is different. Uh, maybe the Estonia is definitely better paying salaries uh, in production. This is definitely uh, like it has been for, for, for quite, a, quite a long time. So, yeah. And, and also Latvia pays higher salaries to, to executives. Maybe Estonia has uh, kind of more, how to say, I don't know. Maybe it's not like that, but more like 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 Scandinavian approach that we don't have so big companies and everybody is like more equal. But maybe it's also stereotype. But if we look at the numbers, then our executives very often don't have such a high salary level compared to Latvia or Lithuania. But Latvian companies are bigger. Lithuanian companies are bigger. Again, okay, we're Baltic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Some more questions. No. So that will be the last. Uh, ah, okay. The or, last or if you want, you can. Uh, and the uh, um, availability of resources in Latvia of the employees, because I, I'm from GBS sector, mm -hmm. and we are working mostly with young people and uh, with education, and we really see um, yeah. not enough people. We don't have even candidates who apply at all for some basic positions yeah yeah and where, where are they where are they in the countryside in the Estonia, lithuania where people <laughs> don't uh, young people are free they are much more free than uh, we are so they may not be in the politics at all <laughs> they may work in australia get uh, like get experience elsewhere so in a way it's good if they get uh, a better 
understanding of the world and and don't uh, like uh, are not here all the time but yes with with young people it is difficult uh, and and that in, in a way you also have them in fewer numbers mm. because uh, at least in Estonia, the last bigger rate of birth was at uh, 2007, and then again the rate has dropped. So probably at the moment we have uh, those in labour markets who were born around uh, uh, 1998, uh, 2000, 2002, so young people. And what was interesting, for example, that in Latvia, uh, do you remember, Christiana, that uh, we had um, those generations in the survey that in Latvia, the number was twice as much as in Estonia. We had 4% and you had 8 and Lithuania also had late 8%. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. yes, yes. It was like twice as much as in, in Estonia. So if it's okay, we have even fewer. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the answers are in demographics, mm -hmm. surely. When we, uh, when we gained back the the, the independency, then the uh, number of births went really down. Mm -hmm. And now, currently, those youngsters are stepping into the uh, labor market. And that's why we are lacking and we will lack the resource. The, the Some of the keys are in the topics what Janis currently told about the artificial intelligence, about the digitalization, autom automation, and those things. Uh, and what I wanted to mention regarding Latvia, what has happened during uh, two last years, um, on those generations we currently have five generations in the market but what we see from the statistics what has changed the number of those youngsters yes and, uh, that has risen but the number of those baby boomers or those who has already 60 years old now the number has dropped mm -hmm. um, we have uh, talked a lot about uh, uh, equality in terms of sex i mean female male and uh, equal pay but what we have seen actually is uh, uh, the discrimination based on age. I mean, uh, all of a sudden, uh, based on many uh, uh, employers, uh, people actually get rid of all thinking power after they are 60. But people actually uh, work longer. And, and it's also one possibility to increase resources, to have those people who, who already... Don't apply. Yeah, but have we, have you done anything for them to uh, that that is comfortable for them to apply? No, we, we have a couple it. people from more than fifty. Yeah, we have them, but the, mm -hmm. it's really English language which is a requirement, and I think for this population that's an issue usually. Yeah, and uh, but everything else, basic accounting is there. Yeah, but they don't apply. It's not that we don't take them. But uh, is it still the case that uh, employers are preparing to say youngsters more than, let's say, not necessarily youngsters, but... Uh... Do you know what is the age, especially for men in Latvia, where you get the maximum salary? I would say maybe it's something between 35 and... Uh, 40. 40. 40 is the... And then the salary starts to drop and then this is the answer to your question for men for men and also women are it's like in or... it's in baltics it is in the baltics uh again if we compare some statistics a few years ago 42 43 years old was the 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 like the borderline when the salary started to drop down no it is already 40 years so do we hire oh, youngsters? <laughs> do we hire youngsters? Yes, we do. We do prefer a younger people uh, better than than older. But for oh, us, it really have... depends on the position because we, if we hire people even thirty years old, they are not mature enough to to make decisions, to uh, take managerial positions. They still have to learn, and sometimes we do prefer to take older people with experience, but they are not. They are afraid to come to work for. <laughs> because of English. And, and this is, a, it's a very interesting topic because actually it, um, it goes uh, on, on, on two direction. One of them is to um, government institution, how to support uh, 
people to uh, learn all the necessary skills and how to have uh, all the modern, so to say, skills updated. It's it's a very long policy. It doesn't take uh, only six months to, to know a language or, or have a very good uh, computer skills. But at the same time, it's also message to uh, to companies. Have they made all the positions uh, 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 fit also for those five generations which we have in the labour market so that uh, also elderly people can, can work comfortably but uh, it's, it's, it's again the question of diversity and it's not easy because uh, of course it's much much easier to manage a company where people don't belong to so many different generations because they think alike and they they have kind of productivity more or less alike and uh, needs more or less alike. We, we are talking about benefits. Uh, you don't offer a 60-year-old employee the same, uh, which, which maybe a 20-year-old uh, needs. So there are like so much uh, diversity uh, in, in needs and, and in, in preferences and etc. But I think it, it will come. It may be not there, but companies are more and more talking about how to how to address uh, uh, the different needs of, of different generations so that they can be as productive as possible. So up to their, their own kind of uh, level. And, and yes, if, if somebody is, uh, is like 45 or 50, it doesn't mean that uh, he necessarily knows or, or, or is able to do less compared to somebody who is 30. Yeah, okay. but the career moves <laughs> like that. Well, the, the salary salary uh, uh, no, in, in all countries in Estonia it was uh, somebody who was born in uh, in uh, 1979 so this was the highest salary level and it has been there for a couple of years already <laughs> so now, now, now I should somehow finalize this <laughs> very, very optimistic. <laughs> but, 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 uh, Christiana. So, if, if still, I, if my task is to finalize the meeting on a positive note, note three, three positive things, three positive things out of uh, everything you shared. For people who run the companies, who own the companies, who manage the companies, who try to recruit those uh, uh, various aged people. So three good things which you can come up. Now, first of all, as, as our prime minister once said, a good crisis uh, should not be uh, uh, left uh, wasted. It's it's something like that. So I would see that uh, the present situation has more It has lots of uh, threats, but it, ha it has a lot of opportunities also. And we have to be creative because uh, those uh, those uh, things which which uh, worked well in the past don't work uh, now any longer. And, and I would say that it's not so much a question about Latvia, Lithuania or Estonia, but it's somehow we have to kind of find way how, how to leverage ourselves like, like the, 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 the Baltic area, not just each separate country. Okay, that was one thing. Christiana. Second for you. I have a bell aim. Swish. Swish. Mm -hmm. Swish yeah. to our employers, actually. And uh, what we are, and especially I am facing um, the question that uh, what else should we do? What more we can do? What what benefits do we have in the market? What we can add in addition? Uh, ask your employees, value your employees' input. And uh, this is, uh, we will never be able to catch up most probably all the, all the changes in the market, but see what is important for your employees and do those things. I, I think that we need to uh, to follow up the diversity. So we have one person online, so we need to cherish him as well, Yanni. So what is your third uh, positive thing? I assume that it's on data, but uh, still, you, you choose. <laughs> uh, sorry, third positive thing on what? 
So, so we, we are trying to finish the day because there was a lot of tough discussions uh, in the room, but we tried to finalize the day with three positive things. Idia mentioned that uh, don't waste the crisis. There's always something you can take. Uh, Christiana said, if you don't know how to cherish your people, just ask them how to, how to treat them better. And the third one is yours, your suggestion. <laughs> no? Use data as uh, as an asset, not liability. <laughs> So, so three fantastic takeaways from from today. Applause to to the speakers. I will give some some uh, thank yous to to all of you. She's smart because of being a student here. Yeah. Yeah, many thanks for coming thank from Estonia today. Thank you. Uh, especially thank you for, for inviting us. And, and please, uh, Jan, this is this is uh, uh, CV. This is this is for you. I will pass it to Christian because thank you. She works with you every day. So, <laughs> so thank you, thank you very much. And uh, till till the till the next public uh, lecture, it will come soon. So and stay thank tuned. you for organizing. Yeah, thank right. you very much for being here. So you can still mingle and and and, and enjoy and ask the questions which you didn't ask. Jan, thank you very much. I will now yeah. disconnect. Sure. Yeah? Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.